Wow, geez, no pressure, huh? Um, thank you so much for that really warm introduction, and thank you for having me. Uh, thank you, NDF organizers, for bringing me down. Um, it's been really exciting to catch these sessions and, and to meet all of you guys down here. I've never been to this part of the world, so um, it's been a treat. Um, so, uh, it's supposed to be this way. Um, as we all know, uh, cultural institutions are recalibrating for the 21st century. I don't have to tell you all this. That's been the topic of conversation these past two days. Uh, you all know this better than anyone. And you are the ones leading that charge. Um, we're reevaluating how we perform our core activities in the digital age, strategizing for how to evolve with the times, better serve our missions and our audiences, investigating and inventing best practices for the age of big data, of iPhones and 3D printing and virtual reality, and the next newfangled thing that hasn't yet been invented. Um, so how do cultural memory institutions evolve in the information age when all the world's information is at our fingertips? Some of us are activating our spaces in new and interesting ways, um, serving our local communities by offering things like community yoga. Of course, there are many uh, excellent uh, media lab, cultural lab initiatives, uh, some of which are springing up, others which are shutting down. Um, this is a project from the Met Museum's uh, Media Lab that recently closed, um, but did some incredible work such as uh, Color the Temple, the project shown here, which was a light installation that transformed uh, the Met's iconic Temple of Dundor using projection mapping to digitally restore color on the temple's etchings. We're starting R&D departments, uh, wherein we can investigate, ideate, and prototype possible museum futures. Um, for those of you who don't already follow Paola Antonelli's uh, R&D salons from MoMA, I highly recommend it. Um, she brings together some excellent speakers from different disciplines to address pressing topics that are relevant not only to cultural institutions, but culture more broadly. And they're all archived online, and I encourage watching them, if only to catch Paola's excellent introduction Actions. Um, and then most recently, we're launching incubators and co-working spaces. Here's a pic of our own in initiative, New Inc. Um, as you know, we at the New Museum were one of the first museums to start a cultural incubator, and I'm happy to say that we're no longer the only one, and that each approach has offered something new and taken a unique spin and continued to experiment with the model. And before I delve into the specifics of our program and how and why we started it and what we've learned, I want to talk about what is an incubator and define the term because it means different things to different audiences. And uh, in the States especially, I think it's taken on a very specific definition as it relates to startup culture and Silicon Valley and other centers of technological innovation. So what is an incubator? <laughs> um, in some ways, incubators in all their forms remain consistent to their original definition. The term incubator first appeared in 1845 to describe an apparatus for hatching eggs by applying artificial heat, um, though the root term dates back to the mid-1600s. It was a life-giving and life-sustaining apparatus that helped nurture and care for hatchlings that were unable to care for themselves. From chickens, it evolved to perform the same function for human life. In the late 1870s, a French obstetrician named Dr. Stéphane Tonnier uh, witnessed an incubator warming baby chickens at a Parisian zoo and uh, sought to apply the technology to the problem of infant mortality. From there, the idea spread initially as a medical curiosity. It was presented at various expositions and world fairs, such as a baby incubator exhibit pictured here in Berlin from 19, uh, 1896. And this particular exhibition, uh, documented here via an engraving from the Illustrated London News, spawned many imitators, including sideshows at the Trans-Mississippi Exposition, the Chicago Century of Progress Exhibition, the Pan American Exposition, New York World's Fair, and most famously at the Coney Island theme park. 
In New York, infant incubators were a popular Coney Island sideshow attraction for decades, situated alongside the sword swallowers, bearded ladies, and Lionel the lion-faced man. The exhibition ran from 1903 to the early 1940s, and by the time that it closed in 1941, the exhibit um, went on to a preemie ward at Cornell's New York Hospital. Incidentally, 1941 was also the year a young man named Joseph Mancuso was born. In 1959, at the age of 18, Mancuso founded the Batavia Industrial Center in New York, which was reported to be the first business incubator. Much like chicken and infant incubators before it, the business incubator was designed to help fledgling businesses, in this case, light manufacturing businesses, get off the ground and learn to be self-sufficient by providing them affordable shared workspace, business training, access to loans, and other crucial administrative services. Most new businesses fail in their first two years of operations, uh, so incubator programs were designed to help them get through this volatile and vulnerable period and to increase their likelihood of survival and bring new jobs and economic growth to the towns. The concept of providing uh, business assistance services to early stage companies didn't catch on right away. Um, and it wasn't until the 1980s that we saw this model proliferating. Um, in the 1980s, there were about 12 business incubators in the US, all of them in the industrial Northeast, which had been hard hit by plant closures in the previous decade. But the idea proliferated in the 90s and 2000s. And as of October 2012, there were over 1,000 250 incubators in the US alone, and about 7,000 incubators worldwide, according to the International Business Innovation Association. The incubation model has been adapted to meet a variety of needs, from fostering commercialization of university technologies, to increasing employment in economically distressed communities, to serving as an investment vehicle for venture capitalists. At their core, all business incubators nurture the development of young companies, helping them survive and grow during the startup period. It may surprise some of you to learn that an overwhelming majority of incubators, some 93% as of 2012, are nonprofit and are focused on economic development, that is, creating jobs by supporting and attracting new businesses to their towns and cities. Incubators provide a variety of services that can include business training programs, affordable or free workspace, equipment, discounted or free administrative services, networking, and access to funding. And they can target and serve a wide variety of industries, such as technology, which we all know, which makes about 37% of incubators, but also food, fashion, manufacturing, medical, entertainment, and of course the arts. Most incubators, about 54%, are mixed use, meaning that they serve multiple industries. Incubators have business models of their own and are designed to be self-sustaining. Most of them charge rent or other fees from the companies they serve. They typically receive some startup funding and grants or corporate sponsorship, but are expected to be self-sufficient in the long term. Who sponsors incubators? About 32% of North American business incubators are sponsored by academic institutions, two to four year colleges. 25% um, are sponsored by economic economic development organizations, 16 by government entities, 4% of incubators are hybrids with more than one sponsor, 4% uh, are sponsored by for-profit entities like venture capitalist firms, and uh, the others don't have a sponsor or host organization. Today, due to the success and popularity of several high-profile American startup programs, there's a bit of confusion around the term incubator. People often associate it with programs like Y Combinator and Techstars because of their fame, but those programs are actually accelerators. Whereas an incubator will take very early stage companies that may still be in the concept idea phase and teach them how to put together a business plan, prototype, 
uh, do product development, and understand their market, accelerators look for companies that already have what's known as a minimum viable product. They already built something, tested it, and have some traction going. Incubators are much longer term, and typically uh, companies can stay for one to three years, whereas accelerators are usually a three-month program. Most importantly, though, incubators are typically nonprofit. They usually charge rent from uh, the companies that uh, work out of their space, but they don't often invest in the companies they work with. Accelerators, on the other hand, usually provide some seed investments and take between six to eight percent equity from the companies they work with, meaning that they become a co-owner. Um, they have a vested interest in seeing those companies succeed so that they can reap the return on that investment when the company grows, uh, is acquired, or goes for an IPO. This accelerator model emerged during the dot-com boom in the 90s and has really spread um, in the recent startup boom. And somewhere along the line, the terms became somewhat conflated. So when we said we were starting an incubator, people thought we were starting an accelerator, and they were very confused. Um, so why an incubator at a contemporary art museum? Good question. Um, as I hope you can tell from my brief overview, incubators can take many forms and span many industries. As economic development initiatives, they help breathe life into struggling neighborhoods, cities, communities, or industries. Our incubator is focused on the creative industry because that's our core community. That's who comes to the museum. That's the, the vitality of the city that we uh, are part of and want to support. And these programs are most effective when they are site-specific and respond to the needs of a particular community. Um, let me tell you a little bit about the New Museum to contextualize this. The New Museum was founded in 1977 by uh, Marsha Tucker, who was interested in bringing the scholarly practices of museums to younger artists and their work. She imagined an institution devoted to presenting, studying, and interpreting contemporary art, which, hard to believe though it may be, amidst the current frenzy for contemporary art, was a novel idea in 1977. And here she's pictured uh, with uh, the first exhibition, Memory, at C Space, uh, which was in our first location uh, at the New School. The New Museum's mission is simple, new art, new ideas. We are not a collecting institution, which allows us to stay focused on the present and the future and to take greater risks. Throughout our history, we've always been a radical, experimental institution that was among the first museums to show artists like Joan Jonas, Bruce Nauman, Hans Hock, and Jeff Koons, who's pictured here at our Broadway storefront window gallery in 1980. We've also long embraced artists working with new technology. Here we have a show from Rhizome's Art Base. Rhizome is one of our affiliates and partners. Um, they've been an affiliate of the museum since 2003, um, and they are a digital arts-focused institution that also does quite a bit of work in digital preservation. So if you aren't already following their work, definitely look them up. They're also currently one of the anchor tenants at New Inc. In 2007, after 30 years of existence, we moved into our current home on the Bowery, which is our first uh, building, uh, designed by the Pritzker Prize winning Japanese architect Sana. And then we promptly turned our brand new building over to artist Karsten Holler, who drilled massive holes through the fourth, third, and second floors to install his famous slide. In 2011, in response to the recession and the global financial crisis, we launched a new initiative called Idea City, dedicated to exploring the role of culture in shaping the future of our cities. The festival brings together artists, architects, urban planners, activists, and policymakers to collectively imagine and discuss how we might tackle some of the biggest challenges facing our cities today and the years to come. This last initiative is important because although it predates my time at the New Museum, I think it is a major precedent that informed and influenced the eventual idea of New Inc., the very notion of a museum-led incubator. And I think it was a turning point where the museum started to understand its civic impact and to think of itself not only as a public servant, but also as a citizen. 
The new museum's director, Lisa Phillips, and deputy director, Karen Wong, became attuned to the ways in which our city was changing through their engagement with organizations like the Municipal Arts Society and the Center for an Urban Future. They met the founders of companies like Kickstarter and WeWork, a massive co-working chain, who were having a profound impact on the way the creative sector and many other sectors were making and working today. And their work with the Idea City Festival caused many to ask, these conversations that you're hosting are great, but what are you doing in your own backyard and how are you serving your own community? So the museum set about investigating and imagining what kind of impact we could have on the local community. The museum had been fortunate enough to acquire the building next door in early 2008, shortly after moving onto the Bowery, so we had real estate to work with. And the, muse uh, the building came with some tenants, so we uh, hadn't actually activated yet, and so we set about imagining what we can do with this space that was uh, different from our core exhibition activities. They researched what was already happening in the creative sector in New York City to learn more about where the gaps were. For instance, a report from the Center for an Urban Future found that while New York graduates more art and design graduates than any other U.S. city, many of them want, who, who want to stay and build their businesses and careers here, a staggering 88% felt like they did not have the adequate business and entrepreneurial training in order to do so. And that's a big problem, because in today's shifting work culture, increasingly these skills matter more and more, as the workforce and more importantly job opportunities continue to move away from full-time employment to freelance and contract positions. And this is being sold to many of us as a new source of freedom and empowerment in the digital age. You know, quit your day job, do what you love, set up an Etsy store and, you know, kickstart your project. Um, but, you know, these new opportunities also come with greater risks and liabilities that many of us, especially those who I think come from the creative sector, are not incredibly well equipped to tackle. It's not something that we learned in art school. And there are a few resources in place to help artists and designers develop these strategic skills and also to understand the way that business works, both in the worlds of art and entrepreneurship. Um, we surveyed the landscape, we studied and drew inspiration from existing programs that occupy similar spaces and set about building a community and a professional development program geared towards creatives who are tackling entrepreneurial questions. New Inc. is not an artist residency, although New Museum does do residencies and will continue to do them, and it's not a replacement for the residency. It's not a co-working space because we do have a very rigorous uh, professional development program, um, and it is a curated space. Um, it's not a tech incubator uh, in the sense that you know, or I should say it's not a tech accelerator because it's not trying to accelerate businesses, um, nor is it a university media lab um, because we are uh, not only trying to invent things, although that's definitely something that we hope will happen, but also to provide infrastructure um, and uh, logistics support to some of the things that have already been invented. So we were able to raise over two million from our board of trustees and some government and philanthropic uh, funding to build out an 8,000 square foot space on the second floor of uh, 231 Bowery, the building next door to the museum. We also assembled an incredible advisory council to help guide and steer us in this initiative um, because we uh, didn't know a whole lot about running an incubator program. Um, and the advisory council is a mix of uh, people like Yancey Strickler, who's the CEO of Kickstarter, Fred Dust, who's a partner at IDEO, um, Andy Weissman, who's a partner at Union Square uh, Ventures, a major uh, capital firm, and uh, thought leaders like uh, John Maeda, Kate Crawford, our own Lauren Cornell. What were our goals? Um, I think first and foremost, we aim to build community. And I think that's where we've seen the most traction. Um, it's a very interdisciplinary community, and I'll get more into that later, um, to establish a new platform to support creative work, um, creative work that didn't necessarily fit into our existing purview, but that we felt was related to uh, the greater scope of what we were interested in and, and uh, talking about in spaces like Idea City. 
Um, investigate new models uh, to support uh, and sustain creative practice. New models that uh, were kind of responding to the shifting economic and also uh, information age infrastructure. Um, expand our impact through collaborations with civic and industry partners. Um, we've done a, a few small collaborations with companies like Microsoft Connect, um, but and we're about to announce a big partnership with uh, Bell Labs Labs, which for those of you who don't know, has uh, had a historic um, legacy of supporting artists and uh, technology initiatives. Um, and to also catalyze the growth and development of New York City's creative economy. I want to pause for a moment and, and kind of talk about what I mean by the creative economy. Um, these are some of uh, what falls under this category of the creative industries. Um, and uh, in your cities, I imagine, as, as in ours, um, people are looking at what the impact of the creative economy is. How does culture drive uh, business, tourism, um, create new jobs, um, what does it do? Um, and I should add that all all of these categories uh, in some way, shape, or form have been represented at New Inc. Uh, in the form of new businesses, um, independent artists or designers who are working in these spaces and disciplines. Um, this is just a snapshot of uh, some stats about the creative economy uh, in the US, but also in Europe and Asia. Um, just to give you a sense of its impact and scale. And increasingly, you know, we're looking at these things to try and understand um, what is the need and the opportunity and the obligation of programs like ours, which are looking at this kind of cross section of the arts, um, the city, and uh, small business development, economic development. Um, and why does it matter? Um, I think we tend to associate innovation and economic development with big business, with the technology sector. But as one of our advisors, John Maeda, likes to say, innovation doesn't just come from maths and sciences and new chemicals and equations. It comes from a human place. It comes from human experiences. And I think the arts do that better than anyone else. I think artists uh, and designers and creative thinkers they're di divergent thinkers. They explored a wider range of possibilities. And that allows them to come up with ideas that someone who's typically focused on the end product, the bottom line, may not allow themselves to venture and explore. Um, so the program, what is it that we are actually doing? A uh, couple of nuts and bolts. Um, New Inc. has 40 full-time and 40 part-time members. Many of these are teams. The largest team, I think, currently is about four or five. We have several of that size. And we also have, uh, the majority of them are probably about uh, teams of two, as well as many individuals, some of whom are artists and uh, dancers and musicians. Um, uh, we have two anchor tenants, as I mentioned. Rhizome is one of them. And the other is Columbia University's graduate Graduate School of Architecture Planning and Preservation, who run kind of an incubator within our incubator where they uh, select about 20 postgraduates who have come out of their school um, who are launching new studios and businesses and publications and things like that. Um, we do have a business model. We are uh, self-sustaining. Uh, so like a co-working space and like traditional incubators, our members pay $600 a month for a full-time membership and $350 a month for a part-time membership. And this is pretty consistent with what they might pay at a WeWork or another co-working space. Um, our members retain 100% of their intellectual property. Their ideas are entirely their own. We do not have a stake to it. Um, and we offer uh, weekly professional development programs, a uh, mentorship program wherein we pair our uh, members with a dedicated mentor, uh, shared equipment, access to tools like 3D printers, a laser cutter, cameras, projectors, um, office hours with New Inc. staff and New Museum staff, as well as some outside experts. And we have a, a team of five support staff and are growing. Um, a snapshot of what our community looks like as we're entering into our third year. Um, diversity has been really important for us and has been one of the things that we've looked at from the beginning. Um, we often 
kind of started out talking about cognitive diversity and the value of interdisciplinary environments as being generative spaces for new ideas, new ways of thinking and working, and likewise for collaboration. Um, but we've also made sure that our space is inclusive and um, is allowing for um, women and people of color and communities that may not um, have the means to participate in a program like ours or may kind of self-select out of these types of programs um, that they have access to the space as well. Um, We've seen an uptick in the caliber of applicants. Um, this year, we also have a strong social impact, social justice, and education focus. I attribute that in part due to the um, uptick in the number of women and people of color members, but also in, uh, to the political climate as well. And uh, about 40% of our members receive some sort of financial assistance. Uh, the bulk of this goes to support diversity initiatives in the space. And as you can see also, uh, our community is quite uh, split in terms of the types of business models. So we do have individual artists, um, some design studios that work with clients, um, startups that are building a digital or physical product, as well as nonprofits. Um, some of the sectors that we're currently looking at are uh, virtual reality, artificial intelligence, immersive theater and interactive storytelling, responsive architecture. Um, these, I think, you know, vary from year to year. Um, some of them are directed by calls that we pull out that say, you know, we're really interested in artificial intelligence and what it's going to mean for the creative sector. We're looking for projects in this space. And some of it, like for instance, uh, education, and we also have um, a strong uh, contingent of groups this year addressing accessibility and disability. And this was something that we saw happening in the application pool. So sometimes trends are revealed to us. Um, I think the, the desire to make it so interdisciplinary is, really rooted in this belief of creative ecosystems um, and wanting to build a space uh, where we can create a network that goes on to serve our core community, our members, after they leave here. What we've seen is a lot of people uh, working together, um, developing new initiatives, new partnerships, hiring one another, and each person in the cohort is essentially a node into an even broader network within New York City. So if I'm a musician and I'm working on a new performance piece and I am developing, say, a set design, I might collaborate with the architect sitting next to me or the fashion designer for the costumes or the uh, software programmer to have some sort of uh, projection mapping happening. So this type of um, ecosystem environment was something that was really intentional and part of the way that we curate the space. Um, the space, as I mentioned, is very collaborative and we encourage this through the programs that we run, um, through community building initiatives, through social activities, um, and through facilitation on behalf of the staff. Um, and this piece of, you know, how do we uh, bring people together, create a cohesive community culture with a group as large as ours is one of the pieces that I think has been evolving um, over the past three years. The program design has also been, I think, the biggest area that has evolved and that we've been iterating on. Because in starting a program like this, it's not enough to simply look at a business uh, curriculum or a lean startup methodology and adapt it uh, for this type of space. Um, most of those uh, practices and case studies and even just the language itself really doesn't translate. People look at you and be very confused about what you mean when you say minimum viable product. Um, and one of the things that we've really uh, had to do is uh, figure out how to design a program that cuts across many of these different sectors and ways of working. Um, this is a snapshot of what a typical month looks like for us. Um, we have different types of things happening, but there's a lot going on all the time. Um, we hold two demo days, uh, one at the midway point six month mark, and one at the 12 month mark. Um, our program lasts a year. Um, and this is an opportunity for our members to present their work to the public, receive feedback, and they present before a curated audience that includes uh, potential funders like venture capitalists or philanthropists, but also curators, creative directors, influencers from the art, tech, and business worlds. 
Um, we, at the end of the year, also do a showcase. Um, this is where we present some of the more experiential projects from the cohort. Um, so uh, in our first year, the showcase was incredible because of the eight projects that we presented, all of them were collaborations that emerged from the community. Um, and we've also started running a conference on uh, virtual reality and augmented reality because so many of our community members were investigating these spaces. So really quick, uh, I just want to go over a couple of case studies about what we've seen over the past uh, two, two and a half years now. So over the past two years, we've incubated 80 new ventures, and that includes individuals as well as companies of up to 11 people. Um, 160 new jobs created in that process. Um, and collectively, they've raised over $8 million in capital. Um, not everyone was pursuing uh, fundraising, um, but that includes grants, it includes crowdfunding, it includes VC funding and angel funding. Um, so who were some of these companies and individuals and what did they work on. Um, one common theme that we see at New Inc, and that I think was an inspiration for New Inc, is this uh, idea of the artist as inventor. Um, in this case, uh, this company, Depth Kit, they uh, hacked together a standard SLR camera and a Microsoft Connect to create a new form of filmmaking, a volumetric filmmaking tool, where it's basically using the depth data from a Connect um, and layering the image data from an SLR to create this uh, 3D film. Um, and they created this for themselves because they were artists and filmmakers and they were using it uh, in their own work. They released it open source. It uh, attracted a lot of attention and got a ton of traction. Um, Eminem even used it in a music video. Um, and uh, they received a lot of inquiries from the visual effects industry and many people were working in VR uh, for a, a professional version of this tool. And these guys really had an identity crisis in the program because they saw themselves as artists. And all of a sudden, they were exploring this idea of potentially starting a company um, and pursuing venture capital to develop this professional tool. Um, at the end of the first year, they left thinking they were going to continue as artists. Six months later, they came back to us and they said, you know what, we're going to do, we're going to build a company, we're going to uh, raise uh, some funding, um, can you connect us to some VCs? And uh, they just closed a round of a million dollar funding. Um, a different uh, example is a company called Monograph, which is a platform that makes it easy for digital creators of all kinds to construct licenses for the commercial use of their digital work. It's uh, built using the blockchain, so uh, for those of you who attended Eric's keynote um, yesterday, um, it's that encryption uh, technology. and. Um, it was similarly created by an artist, an uh, artist who's been working with digital media for almost 20 years. Um, his work is in the Whitney and the MoMA and the Guggenheim, and he has been very frustrated at the fact that um, collectors don't view digital work with the same kind of uh, seriousness that they view you know, a painting or a sculpture or a photograph, something that's physical and tangible. Um, and you know, he came up with this idea of using the blockchain chain to track the uh, provenance and the authentication of ownership of these digital works. Um, and the idea has evolved and expanded since then, um, but the company has uh, grown. Um, they were with us for two years, and um, they're at, uh, I think, 10 staff now, um, and have moved out to another space. Print All Over Me is another company that was with us for two years. It is a fashion platform. Um, it's essentially designed to democratize the creative act of designing your own clothes. Um, it's a platform where you can go and upload any image, whether it's one of your own design or something that you found on Tumblr, and create custom garments or accessories. Um, at the time I last checked, they had 
8 million designs uploaded onto their site um, and growing. Um, they're really interesting. It's a brother and sister duo and they're incredibly creative. Um, they've gotten to a point with this company where it's kind of working you know, pretty smoothly. They even own their own manufacturing and, and have relocated it um, from China to Georgia because they're very committed to sustainability. Um, but in their second year at New Inc, they launched a second company um, because they're just overachievers. Um, <laughs> And uh, this company, Cocoa, um, is essentially an easy tool to create 3D environments um, with the craze around uh, VR and AR. The barriers to entry are still quite high. You need to learn how to 3D model. You need to learn how to use Unity. Or even if you're doing 360 video, you still need to stitch together six video streams from your GoPro um, or use one of the new fangled um, Samsung cameras. Um, but uh, in this uh, startup, they essentially created a drag and drop uh, interface tool to create these 3D environments that you can uh, view cross-platform. Um, you can view it uh, in your browser, on your phone, in an Oculus Rift or a Google Glass. Um, or wait, not Google Glass, Google Cardboard. Um, VR is a trend at New Inc. right now. Um, this is a, a different uh, group, which is a, a content studio. Um, they're filmmakers. They created a virtual reality film called Giant, which was a sensation at Sundance last year. Um, it's a story about a family that's stuck in the uh, makeshift uh, bomb shelter in their basement and they can't leave, they waited too long to leave um, and they're telling their young child the story of a giant stomping overhead as um, bombs are exploding. It's a very emotional tale. The director um, uh, grew up in Serbia uh, and so it's a very personal story as well. And uh, yeah, it's been one of the most kind of written about and, and lauded uh, virtual reality pieces. They're currently working on their second story, which was also just accepted to Sundance. Um, Rachel Rawson is a, a visual artist uh, who's a painter, but also works with uh, virtual reality. Um, I believe it was Emily from, from Curio, uh, or not Curio, but um, who is showing the tilt brush video yesterday. Um, and Rachel is the artist in that video, actually. Um, and uh, her work is just pure art. You know, she's experimenting with this new technology from a completely different left of center uh, perspective than what you typically see. Um, she's playing with uh, themes like gravity uh, and physics and time, uh, really kind of investigating the boundaries of this new tool in ways that uh, people that are, I think, are coming from the gaming or film world are not doing quite so much. Um, and I think this is one of the reasons why it's important to keep artists in the mix in spaces like this. Um, we have several studios uh, that are exploring things like uh, interactive sound and uh, exhibition design. Um, this is one studio, Dave and Gabe, uh, that has, again, been very successful. They uh, were awarded two Can Lions uh, at Can this past July. Um, another company, um, this one is called Artifon. It is a digital music instrument. Um, it's essentially an instrument that you can play like a guitar, like a violin, like a cello, like a drum pad, like a piano. Um, it's designed to make uh, music really accessible for beginners, so you can pick it up and play something that's gonna sound fantastic, but um, also it's going to scale with you as you grow, so a professional musician can pick this up and use it to compose you know, on the road, on the go. Um, this year, uh, we have started 
incubating museums, miniature museums. Um, this is a project called Micro Museums. Um, it is a mobile museum. Um, it's about uh, six feet high by three feet wide, about the size of, say, a vending machine, and uh, features uh, 15 exhibitions or exhibits. Um, they collaborated with 35 scientists on this first museum, so it's quite rigorous um, in its research. And these are designed to go to, say, outer borough schools, but also to places like the DMV or hospital waiting rooms um, that they uh, have termed kind of dehumanized zones. Um, education is a big theme this year, as I mentioned. Um, this is an, an initiative called Power Plant, which is a, a digital arts school, an artist-run school um, that is located in Bushwick um, and uh, provides free digital art classes to teens. Um, they're a nonprofit. They're trying to understand how to be uh, sustainable, how to work with a board, and these are things that we can help them with because we are uh, we have some expertise in that. Um, we also work with artists. Uh, disability is, is a focus this year as well. Um, this is Alice Shepard. She is a wheelchair-based dancer. Um, and she is working on a new performance uh, and building this system of ramps that she wants to disseminate open source into different spaces. The project looks at um, the aesthetics of uh, differently abled bodies, um, explores new forms of movement. And at New Inc., she's working on the kind of administrative side of how to develop a touring production, how to fi finance this project, um, how to build a team around it. You know, all of these things that are kind of the invisible uh, aspects of producing work of this nature. Um, and also the, the marketing and storytelling aspect of this is equally important because for her it is very much an advocacy project. Um, and the last project I'll show is a project called Elia Life Technology, which is an initiative to redesign Braille. And this is a, a major initiative. Um, they've received $2 million in funding from the National uh, Institute of Health. And uh, they're trying to design a more intuitive Braille um, that's based on the kind of visual design of the Roman alphabet, because apparently, the majority of visually impaired folks um, actually can't read Braille. Um, it's very difficult to learn. Uh, it's very difficult to differentiate between letter forms, especially when they're in a sentence. And uh, basing it on uh, the letter form of the Roman alphabet makes it easier for people to uh, learn it because most people used to be able to read at some point. They no longer have literacy because of their visual impairment but they can kind of more easily identify uh, this, the, the letter forms in this design because they have uh, a reference point already. So whereas typical Braille, it might take someone 12 months to learn, um, this one is about three months. Um, and they're currently working with uh, industry partner HP to develop uh, printers to start to put them into workplaces, um, classrooms uh, and other spaces uh, to disseminate this new uh, form of Braille. And finally, I will just say, um, I think our initiative is about re-envisioning the incubator model to foster cultural value, not just capital value, and to reimagine the museum as a space that helps generate and support new ideas that I think benefit uh, the cultural sector, but also uh, our cities more broadly. Um, and I'm excited to see how this idea gets uh, interpreted in different ways and site-specific ways in other institutions as it has been uh, here at uh, Taipapa with the Mahuki Initiative. Um, thank you so much for your time. So I was just wondering, I think we've got a few minutes where we can throw a few cash questions at if you're feeling so inclined before you run off too far. Has anybody got any questions? I was just a little bit bowled away there by the kind of endless stream of amazing things coming out of there. It's fantastic. Has anybody got any questions from the audience you'd like to discuss? If so, I can't quite see, to be honest. There's no hands going up. Adrian, down the front. 
Can we get a microphone down the front here? Thanks. I'll hand over to you. Um, the idea of cultural value is obviously a, a really big thing. That's the you know the slide that really got me. Um, how do you measure it? You know, it's something that we're grappling with now because we're trying to, you know, think about working in ways that, well, we have to. Um, I do start to measure some of these impacts, but we're using models that are designed for startups and things like that, which is primarily based on finance. And so we're grappling with the various models that we could look at. But do you have a model that you, you pitch to the participants, or are they coming up with their own? Or to the participants, um, I don't know that we have a model that we pitch to participants, but in terms of um, how do you measure cultural value, I mean, it's a really big, tough question. Uh, I don't know that we've cracked it yet. Um, we, you know, we do look at some of the typical uh, economic development factors like the jobs created, the number of funding raised, but we're also looking at... Um, uh, kind of peer recognition, right? You know, um, are the artists that are coming out of our program um, getting great residencies and awards of distinction? Are some of the studios getting, um, you know, great uh, portfolio clients and, and awards of distinction in their industry? Um, as far as the nonprofits go, you know, are they still around? You know, and I think time is really uh, the main metric. You know, are these in initiatives around in five years, in 10 years. And if they're not, um, that may be okay too. And where have the founders of these initiatives gone? You know, um, it's as much about creating uh, leaders uh, in the community as it is about creating uh, viable uh, ventures. And um, I think as far as cultural value goes, a big metric for me personally is about relationships. Um, between the various uh, companies and, and individuals at New Inc. Um, how do they uh, build and sustain the relationships during their time here, but also after they leave? And uh, their relationship with the museum and with New Inc. after that. Um, in our uh, panel earlier, Seb uh, mentioned the alumni effect, and that's something that is, I think, really important for us as well. Um, to, to create a ever expanding uh, community around us uh, as a museum and as this uh, incubator program. Anyone else? Um, the microphone didn't have to go very far. Oh. Um, <laughs> uh, kia ora. Um, thank you for your presentation. I was interested in that uh, you talked about the um, some of the new. Uh, um, uh, projects you're, you're supporting um, having more of a social justice bent um, this, this time. And I, I wondered, I may have missed it, but to what extent do, does New Inc. Um, set some themes or sets of priorities with which it, it makes decisions about which, which projects to support or not? Or, or do, do those themes just kind of come through naturally? Sorry, can you phrase that one more time? To what extent does it is it conscious or is it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Do you, do you guys sort of set yeah. a program around certain themes? Yeah. That, um, or or do they just sort of come through um, sort of naturally? Yeah, it's funny because um, when we were first writing the kind of objectives of the program and the values of the program, social impact was one of the terms that we put in there. And we kind of took it out. We were, I think we were, uh, you know, it's such a, a weighted term these days that we were like, oh, maybe we don't want to like put that out at first. And so for us, it's very much been a process of discovery about what feels right and seeing the kind of um, initiatives that we feel like we can impact, um, that we are proud to say we supported, um, and thinking about what kind of impact they're going to have in the world after they leave our space. And so it was interesting to kind of come back around to that in our third year in a much more um, committed way um, as opposed to, you know, maybe having to pull back from it if we felt like it wasn't the right focus. But ultimately, I think 
we are excited about maintaining that as a continuous thread. I don't think that it is a criteria for the program, but it is uh, definitely something that we want to continue to develop and cultivate more of in the space, yeah. Yeah. Um, the, you talked a bit about um, the location that you're in being incredibly important and you're also um, at a slightly wider level within a city that has an amazing density of creative people and uh, creative money compared to other places. Um, what do you think best generalises from your experiences to, I guess, the, the rest of us? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, we talked a little bit about this as well in our last panel. I wish I had that slide. Um, so real estate uh, is challenging in New York and uh, being able to offer space uh, is one of the main, I think, points of attraction and the proximity to the museum is a main point of attraction. But I think um, any museum uh, acts as a credentializer. I think the new museum's reputation and what uh, the affiliation uh, with the museum means for these creative uh, ventures is not to be overlooked. And I would say in some ways it's even more important than the physical space. Um, I think when I mentioned that all of these initiatives should be site specific, um, a big part of it is looking at what your um, what type of community you want to serve, how it relates to your institution and your institution's mission. Um, as well as what that community needs. What is the value add that only you can provide that is something that's missing from the local uh, ecosystem? And for us, you know, when I showed that slide about artist residencies and co-working spaces and tech incubators and media labs, um, that sweet spot for us became apparent as an area that we felt like we could uniquely fill based on some of the things that we saw were lacking. Um, and the people who felt like they didn't neatly fit or belong into these existing programs. Um, the other thing that, you know, from a, a funding perspective um, that I think is really interesting is that um, this initiative has uh, allowed us to connect with different funders who may not be typical funders of the museum. Um, and uh, that has allowed us, uh, for instance, you know, for um, the, some of the diversity scholarships that we do at New Inc, um, Kate Spade and Company Foundation had a fund specifically to support women entrepreneurs and, and women creatives, um, but women entrepreneurs. And so they uh, underwrote uh, 10 women fellows in our space. And that's something that we wouldn't have uh, had access to with any of our existing programs. Uh, one more. All right. Anyone? Okay. All right. Thank you.